passing this legislation is great, but it's insufficient in and of itself. There's much more we need to do to support Ukraine and to push back against Russia all over the world. Welcome to Global Dispatches, a podcast for the foreign policy and global development communities and anyone who wants a deeper understanding of what is driving events in the world today. I'm your host, Mark Leon Goldberg. I am a veteran international affairs journalist and the editor of UN Dispatch. Enjoy the show. At time of recording, the United States Congress was poised to pass a $95 billion foreign aid bill that includes about $60 billion for Ukraine. This aid had been stalled for months, owing mostly to Republican intransigence in the House of Representatives. But now the funding is being released, and according to my guest today, it will have a big impact on the battlefield in Ukraine. Evelyn Farkas is the executive director of the McCain Institute and served as the deputy assistant secretary of defense for Ukraine, Russia, and Eurasia in the Obama administration. We discuss the influence this new aid package will have on the trajectory of the conflict in Ukraine. And as Evelyn Farkas explains, the timing here is critical. She recently returned from Ukraine where official told her they were bracing for a new summer offensive by Russia. We recorded our conversation on Tuesday, April 23rd. I would imagine that by the time you are listening to this, that aid package will have already been passed. And this conversation does a really good job of putting that aid package in the context of the current state of play of the conflict in Ukraine. As always, please visit globaldispatches.org where you can sign up to our newsletter and also become a paying supporter of this show. We depend on your support, so thank you so much for helping us do what we do week in, week out for the last 11 years now. Thank you. Now here is my conversation with Evelyn Farkas of the McCain Institute. We are speaking probably like just a few moments before the U.S. Senate's going to take up this recently passed House package of aid to include about $60 billion of aid for Ukraine. How will this money be spent? Well, first of all, a much needed ammunition, Mark, you know, for the frontline troops in Ukraine fighting off the Russian advance. They have been outnumbered anywhere from 7 to 1 to 10 to 1 in terms of ammunition. That's not just bullets, but missiles. They need simple bullets. They need artillery. They need the ability to keep the Russians at bay. The second major item that they need are air defense systems. And we've seen a lot of media reporting already on the German government urging the U.S. government to provide more Patriot batteries. Certainly, the Ukrainian government has been putting pressure on everyone, stating that the recent damage that was done to the largest power generator in Ukraine might have been avoided if there was air defense. The recent civilian deaths that occurred in Odessa and elsewhere could have been avoided with air defense systems. So air defense systems is the number two after just ammunition across the board. On that question of air defense systems, I mean, it does seem that like a Russian tactic of late has been to try to really just deplete the reserves of Ukrainian air defenses by, you know, sending barrage after barrage of missile attacks. And you think that this new aid package will help stem that tide? Well, it will give the Ukrainians an ability to fight back. Of course, the Russians will keep firing what they can though they also need to be mindful of their defense industrial base abilities to manufacture. The Economist had a piece about a month or so ago talking about the fact that the Russians were running out of gun barrels. And the manufacture of gun barrels is something that's done 
with unique tools that the technology and the tools are Western developed. So Russia would have to get them by circumventing export controls. So there are stresses on the Russian side as well, but it's critical that the Ukrainians get this ammunition, get this weaponry so that they can at least hold back what is right now an attempt by the Russians to advance and what we think is coming, which is a full frontal assault on Ukraine, a new offensive from Russia. And I should add, I was in Ukraine three weeks ago, and that is something that the Ukrainians really highlighted, that they expect a Russian offensive in the spring or summer. Well, can you dive into that a a bit deeper? What is making the Ukrainians think that? And what have they been doing to prepare? And like, how might that new potential Russian offensive manifest itself? So we met with Ukrainian intelligence officials. Obviously, they are not going to tell us their sources and methods and how they know or why they believe Russia will conduct a military offensive. But clearly, Russia has been trying already now to take advantage, and they did manage to retake Adivka, a small, albeit non-strategic town that the Ukrainians had held, and they look like they may be taking another town, also not strategic. So... The Russians are trying to launch small offensives, but a larger one, the Ukrainians believe, will be directed by Putin because President Putin needs to show some kind of victory in order to keep the war momentum going, in order to keep the mobilization of manpower, which he requires to hold the line, but also to make any sort of advances. And the nationalist bloggers in Russia, they're quite active. And if it looks like it's a stalemate for Russia and there isn't real success and forward movement, that may impact on the ability of the Russian president to manage to mobilize more people. Because even though he's paying about 65% of them to fight they still won't be as inclined to take the payment and go fight if they think they're part of a losing proposition. So there are political pressures and there are real kind of war mobilization pressures on the Russian government. And I would imagine the Ukrainians also have access to special intelligence that indicates that Russia is planning an offensive. I mean, this is sort of fascinating to me. You know, if you and I were to have been speaking a year ago, we'd be talking about like a much anticipated Ukrainian yeah. offensive yeah. with Russia on the defense. Now we're talking about Ukraine playing defense against a potential Russian offensive. What changed? How do you diagnose this seeming shift in momentum? Well, I think the Ukrainians, perhaps they missed an opportunity in that they were trying to launch, they they were trying to defend their entire line and they didn't launch an offensive that was pinpointed in one area. If they had surged their forces to one area, they might have succeeded. They didn't do that. Some would say they didn't really even launch an offensive. And then we got into the six-month delay in providing military assistance. And frankly, that meant that the Ukrainians really had to retrench and hang in there until the assistance was approved. So the tide turned in part because the Ukrainians may have made not the best military decisions, but also their foreign allies, and chief among them, of course, the United States, haven't been consistent, haven't been providing enough assistance early enough. And then, of course, this most recent I would argue, hostage taking of the far right in the United States of a broadly popular accepted foreign policy, which is to support Ukraine, had a real impact on the war on the ground. So what impact do you think that this new aid package, these weapons will have on the battlefield? Do you like suspect them to have any sort of meaningful impact? It's a huge morale boost. So that's number one. And that's really important. We can't understate that. Even when I was there Three weeks ago, I will say, though, that people that I spoke to and one of the Western journalists who has colleagues who went out to the front line and basically surveyed the mood of the Ukrainians in the trenches, he said they reported back that the morale was holding, even though at that point they were rationing ammunition, they still had the determination to hang in there. With this new assistance, that determination, that resolve will be further strengthened. 
the Ukrainians really always feel that they have no option. It's existential for them. They have to fight to the last person. And so I think that's not to be underestimated. And then the real the reality that if they can get air defense, it's really important also to the fighters to know that back home, their families are being protected. And for the Ukrainian economy to start really doing more rebuilding, although frankly, they have continued during the war to rebuild. And then of course, the opportunity for the Ukrainians maybe to use some of this weaponry to change the dynamic. One, they could try another offensive, or if they get the right kind of artillery at the right ranges, they could take out, for example, the Kerch Bridge. They could continue to take out some of the Russian logistics assets in the kind of Russian territory that Ukraine has successfully targeted more recently. If the Russians no longer have access to Crimea, for example, for replenishing their troops with gasoline and with ammunition, that could cause damage to the Russian effort at which the Ukrainians could take advantage of. And the Kerch Bridge is that bridge that connects Crimea to Russia. That's right. It's a military target because the trains that run on that bridge are providing materiel for the war effort to the Russians who are in Crimea. So you mentioned just now, this idea that the Ukrainians would you know, fight to the last soldier, that it is existential for them. And of course, that's what we've been hearing you know, all along. They have no choice but to fight. But there is this kind of growing concern we're seeing that Ukraine is simply running out of soldiers. When you were in Ukraine recently, what did conversations just around you know, person power, manpower look like? So the Ukrainians were acutely aware of the fact that they are not only outgunned, but outmanned, so that there are much more personnel fighting on the Russian side, and the Russian government can muster, can mobilize more personnel easier than the Ukrainians because they're not a democracy. And again, they're willing and able to pay people to fight against the Ukrainians. The Ukrainians, of course, have to operate within a democracy. They did, however, manage to recently pass a piece of legislation that expands the category of people who can be called up to service and mobilized. I think it's about 400,000 potential new people who could be called up. In reality, it's probably about half that amount. You know, when you factor in lots of things that cause people to get exceptions, that some military experts say is still not enough to meet Ukraine's needs if Ukraine really wants to defeat Russia on the battlefield. So we'll see what Ukraine does. But, you know, they have to operate within a democracy. And that's why I think it's important for them to be clever and to do things like take out logistics, you know, do things to shake the confidence of the Russians, but also make it harder for them to operate their larger military in Ukrainian territory. So this is a bit of an open-ended question, but as you mentioned, you were very recently in Ukraine. It was unclear while you were there whether or not this aid package would pass. Broadly speaking, what were some of the messages you were getting from your Ukrainian counterparts, and what were some of your top-line takeaways from that trip? Yeah, well, it was funny because I came away actually optimistic, and I published a piece in The Hill which is a magazine you can find in Washington, D.C., aimed at policymakers. And if you go to hill.com, you can find it. Just put in Farkas, Ukraine. But there I outlined my reasons for feeling optimistic. I already told you the one about the resolve of the Ukrainian fighters in the trenches holding. But there are a number of other things. When the Ukrainian intelligence officers spoke about the fact that Russia was going to probably launch an offensive in the spring or summer, the silver lining that they indicated was, well, we think that probably Putin will overcalculate, that he will overplay his hand, that somehow he will overreach. So that also was interesting and I think sounded to me like a valid potential outcome of any Russian offensive. Second, when we looked at the targets, the fact that they had taken out over the last year about 12 different oil refineries in Russia, that was pretty significant, that the Ukrainians had eliminated those or at least crippled them. Again, that impacts logistics for the Russian military. In addition to that, the Ukrainians are now trading 
through the Black Sea. And that is a potential of billions of dollars going forward. So it's economically important, but also, of course, strategically important that they can continue actively moving through their Black Sea territorial waters. And then finally, I think this could be a real game changer. And you may have noted that the legislation that's now about to be passed includes a provision that makes it easier for the frozen Russian assets to be used to help Ukraine in its reconstruction. There are $330 billion, about $217 billion are sitting in accounts in Belgium. The rest are here in the United States. These are Russian assets that we could legally transfer to Ukraine as, you know, kind of reparations. This kind of thing has been done before. For example, when the Pan Am aircraft was shot down over Lockerbie, Scotland years ago, the Libyan government was found responsible and frozen assets were used to pay the victims. So this type of restitution is entirely possible. And if the Ukrainians have $330 billion at their disposal, that's a lot of resources. They would not need all of it for many years. <laughs> so they could spend it over many years. And it would also, Mark, really make them an attractive applicant to the European Union because they would no longer be kind of a poor country entering the European Union. So as you describe it, of course, this is a really monumental piece of legislation. I mean, it should probably have been routine under normal circumstances, but as you noted, for a variety of, of political reasons here in the United States, this was up in the air for such a long time. Like, Why do you suspect that the politics changed on this question of aid to Ukraine in such a way that enabled this piece of legislation to pass after being stalled? for so long. And sort of what does the fact that it passed tell you about American commitment to Ukraine specifically? Could it withstand a potential Trump presidency? So first of all, I think we have to think about why it stalled. The far right, there's a fringe right MAGA movement that has been, frankly, using Kremlin talking points. They have been lifting word for word, saying things like Ukraine is losing. And these politicians blocked the political will of the majority in Congress. So foreign interference is a real, really big problem and a big component of this. Another part of the problem is that President Trump himself has signaled lack of support for Ukraine, let's put it that way, and a desire to end the war quickly Ending the war quickly probably means, you know, capitulating to Russia, because I don't know how else you can end the war quickly unless we get directly involved in militarily. That would end the war quickly. And I don't think that's what President Trump was alluding to when he talked about ending the war quickly. So I think it's important to note that the delay happened because of a fringe element heavily influenced by Russian propaganda and Russian talking points. Why and how all of that came to be, you know, you need to ask investigative journalists, you need to ask the intelligence community. I'm sure they have information about the connections. There may be money involved as well, political contributions. This has been hinted at as well by senior Republican officials in the House of Representatives. So that's why the delay happened. Why we got to where we are today, which is a much better day where the assistance is going to be flowing soon, is because the Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson, decided in his words to do the right thing. He decided that history was watching. He understood what was at stake here. He listened to briefings he received from our Director of Central Intelligence and other officials explaining exactly what the threat is posed by Vladimir Putin and his foreign policy, that the threat is not just directly to Ukraine, that it's to Europe, that it's to the entire NATO alliance, that if the NATO alliance falls, the United States will be endangered. You know, I'm working right now on a piece looking at the impact on Latin America. If Ukraine were to fall, Russia and China and Iran, they would all be emboldened to, frankly, challenge the United States and our allies which are economically, politically, and militarily much stronger than they are. So they want to take us down so that they can have more power and influence and not be blocked. It seems that with the passage of this aid, we're kind of back to where we were you know, several months ago. 
But, you know, several months ago, we were in what the Ukrainians described as positional warfare, what you and I would probably call a stalemate. It wasn't looking great for Ukraine even a year ago or just uh, several months ago. And I'm wondering if in your conversations with Ukrainians, you are hearing any discussion of being an open in any way to some sort of cessation of hostility, some sort of negotiated settlement that's less than what Ukraine is publicly insisting, which is you know the complete eviction of Russia from all of their territory. Are there any hints towards an openness by Ukraine towards some sort of negotiations with Russia? So there is a debate inside of Ukraine and the Ukrainian body politic in the Rada, the parliament, about whether Ukraine fights to the last man or woman and how high a price to pay for victory and what is victory. So I think there is an internal debate on what that should be. But the current government, President Zelensky, is not going to budge from his position that Ukraine wants all the territory back unless he's forced to do so by the electorate. And the majority of Ukrainians still appear to be resolved that they should regain all of their territory. I think if there were a compromise opportunity with someone besides Vladimir Putin, then President Zelensky might consider it. But he does not trust Vladimir Putin, and he shouldn't, because Vladimir Putin has made it clear that any kind of quote unquote, peace would only be a ceasefire, that Vladimir Putin's objective, this neo-imperial new Russian empire would not change. He would maintain that objective. And so he would ultimately at some point, again, try to retake Ukraine by force or through other political or economic pressure, other means. But that Vladimir Putin, if he's on the political scene, Zelensky can't trust him. So if there's another leader that's more pragmatic, maybe Zelensky would say, okay, fine, I'll I'll make some kind of compromise. And I should probably say that these questions about Ukraine's willingness to enter into negotiation with Russia ought to be sort of qualified with the fact that there's like very little evidence, as far as I can tell, that Russia is interested in any sort of negotiated settlement. That's exactly right. That Putin doesn't really, when he talks about wanting compromise or wanting peace or whatever. It's only on his terms, which are unacceptable to Ukraine, to the United States, to the international community. I mean, Russia cannot be rewarded for altering the borders in Europe, seizing and annexing territory for the first time since World War II, since Hitler's Anschluss when he seized Austria. He can't be rewarded for that. So I don't think that Russia's terms, you know, for a peace are acceptable to anyone right now. So in the coming weeks or potentially even days, what are you looking towards that will suggest to you how the trajectory of this conflict may evolve? I'll be curious to see whether Ukraine gets longer range attack of missiles, whether they can then target the Kerch Strait bridge, as we mentioned earlier, whether they are able to take out more logistics, frankly, more aircraft. They've been also successful taking out surveillance aircraft and aircraft that launch the KH-22 missiles at Ukraine. They've had these significant wins, if you will. If they can continue with that effort, that to me could really spell a change in the Russian ability to continue to press forward. The Russians might then eventually become motivated to make a peace. And In addition to that, you know, I'll be curious to see whether they can push the Russians back out of Adivka and keep them from taking new territory. And then, again, the most important thing probably in the short run is to save people's lives. And so air defense is the thing that I would want to see our government prioritize. Lastly, you know, is there like a point you wanted to make or like a question I didn't ask that you wanted to be sure to get in? I think it's important to note, Mark, that while it's absolutely essential and we should celebrate that we are now providing this $61 billion of assistance to Ukraine, it's just another piece of our support to Ukraine, and it's still not sufficient for Ukraine to defend itself. It's still not sufficient for Ukraine to, frankly, 
destroy Putin's foreign policy. And that should be our objective, because if Putin isn't defeated in Ukraine, he will continue to menace, as I said, Europe, the United States, and China will be emboldened vis-a-vis Taiwan and elsewhere. Iran will be emboldened. All of these actors are now working together. And that brings us closer to a dangerous potential World War III scenario. So I think the most important thing to recognize is that passing this legislation is great, but it's insufficient in and of itself. There's much more we need to do to support Ukraine and to push back against Russia all over the world. Well, Dr. Farkas, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Mark. Thanks for listening to Global Dispatches. The show is produced by me, Mark Leon Goldberg. It is edited and mixed by Levi Sharp. If you are listening on Apple Podcasts, make sure to follow the show and enable automatic downloads to get new episodes as soon as they're released. On Spotify, tap the bell icon to get a notification when we publish new episodes. And of course, please visit globaldispatches.org to get on our free mailing list, get in touch with me, and access our full archive. Thank you.